please join me in congratulating this year's Rose Welf Distinguished Alumni Award recipient, the Honorable Justice Abella. Well, welcome to my bar mitzvah. <laughs> this evening, to me, is a tribute to two institutions I love. The first institution is Rose Wolf. I met Rose Wolf decades ago and discovered that a mensch was a gender neutral term. When I first met her, she was famous in the Jewish community for her organizational genius, her philanthropy, her wisdom, her generosity. And when U of T came up with the brilliant idea of making her chancellor, she went from being the iconic woman in the Jewish community to being the bionic one in the U of T one. I never ever met anyone who didn't love and admire Rose Wolf for her warmth, passion for human rights, and commitment, unwavering commitment to the people and institutions she loved. So it's a great honor to be here and be the recipient of this award. And Elizabeth, as legacies go, you were the legacy of whom she was the most proud, and I'm very honored to be able to share the Wolf name um, with your family, so thank you. <laughs> this is a year of anniversaries. It's, as I sat down and thought about what to say about the second institution I love, the University of Toronto, I realize that it's 55 years since I started at University College and the year I had my first convocation at U of T when I graduated from the faculty of the Royal Conservatory of Music. It's almost 50 years since I graduated from law school here, 50 years since I married the man I met at the University of Toronto and chased for three years until I wore him down so he would marry me. <laughs> That's not a joke. Almost 30 years since U of T made me a doctor, thereby reifying every Jewish mother's dream of having a doctor and a lawyer. <laughs> and it's 15 years since they gave me my own room, and I am especially honored that I now, for the first time, have the chance to say thank you to the Halbert family. This room was conceived by Ron Daniels when he was dean and Roz and Ralph Halbert. Without them, this would never have happened. Roz is here, and I would like to pay public tribute for your generosity and friendship over the years. Without you, this room would not be here, so thank you. So what about that University of Toronto journey? When Thomas Wolfe said you can't go home again, he didn't mean the University of Toronto. I preferred Dorothy's sentiments in The Wizard of Oz when she said, there's no place like home. And for me to come home to the University of Toronto as the recipient of the Rose Wolf Distinguished Alumnus Award, a home that allowed me as a young woman to luxuriate in the prospect that anything was possible, a home that prepared me so enthusiastically for the real world, is an honor even beyond my own exaggerated hopes. I was at the University of Toronto from 1964 to 1970. I was in history at University College and in law at the law school. I played piano for the UC Follies and met some newcomer named Lorne Michaels. <laughs> Whatever happened to Lorne Michaels? When I met him again many years later, I said, you know, if you'd followed my career, you could have been a really interesting judge. Served on the UC Lit, was on the Harvard Exchange, and helped in the organization of the University of Toronto teach-ins that brought U of T to the world's attention and Irving Abella to mine. In between, if memory serves, I think I went to a couple of classes. What was striking about the period as I look back on it now was how like-minded everyone I knew seemed to be. We all believed in the perfectibility of the human condition in progressive change, in excellence, in the symbiosis of reason and equity, and in our undisputed duty and right to participate in all of the above. We were the kind of youthful critics when we did criticize, 
who felt that criticism carried with it the responsibility to take ownership of the task of putting back together that which we were taking apart. Absolutely nothing felt beyond remedial attention. We were amateurs in cynicism and genuinely believed that the joint application of talent and hard work would open any door. To us, there was, to paraphrase Truman Capote, only two great sins, boredom and even worse, being a bore. We saw rainbows, not garbage, when we looked at the canals of Venice, and as romantics were impatient at the gap between reality and the ideal. And because we had an answer for everything, the right answer, and held firm and sincere beliefs as to which end of the spectrum to invoke in declaring affiliation with truth, we graduated positive, hopeful, feisty, and somewhat ingenuous. There was more zeal than wisdom in our zealous, youthful wisdom, but at least there was zeal. I now know that the answer to most questions is closer to the spectrum's gray than it is to black and white, and find myself in the paradoxical position of feeling that the more I know and the longer I judge, the less judgmental I am. I have come to understand that the function of a good education is not to learn all the right answers, but to learn all the right questions. To go from the confidence of youth certainty to the confidence of adult ambiguity is one of life's more humbling journeys. But along the way to acquiring more humility, I think we also acquire more judgment. When I started practicing law in the early 70s, I didn't know what feminism meant, let alone how to be one. Having come from a strongly encouraging home and from a university environment where the objective barometer was Marx, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I never questioned whether there were objective barriers to subjective ambitions. I never wondered why there were only five women in my law school class of 150 students, why some women worked for pay and some worked at home for none, why people considered the phrase women professionals to be an oxymoron, or why women were support staff and men were the support. It just was. And then I had clients. Clients who told me what the novels I loved to read could not, about dependency, disadvantage, and despair. And so I learned to shed the orthodoxies and certainties of adolescence and to listen and reappraise. I learned not to give work-life balance interviews to a public newly mesmerized by the apparent ease of professionally successful women, but historically indifferent to the real superwomen who for generations had juggled jobs, family, and guilt without the benefit of housekeepers, financial security, or media curiosity. I learned that the unspoken words of discouragement could be as thunderously inhibiting as the articulated ones, and I learned to take nothing for granted. In the generation since my graduating from this great university in 1970, I have seen, among other things, a charter of rights and freedoms promulgated and extolled as a supreme law of the land, a revolution in expectation by and between men and women, a request by this country's minorities, indigenous people, those with disabilities, and those with different linguistics and sexual identities for a revised social contract and consciousness, and a transitional urge simultaneously to retain the relevant values and discard the inhibiting ones. And while I have seen a discouraging, albeit explicable, backlash to these changes, I've also seen more progress than such rapid change in one generation would entitle us to expect. I remain fully optimistic that with the commitment and contribution of the intellectual samurai universities like the University of Toronto routinely produce, the change will continue and continue in the right direction, and that one generation from now, the restless transition that has been my generation will evolve into the settled and more secure opportunities of the next one. Many of you have had the good fortune to have had lives which represent the unfolding of the happily expected. This, I hope, will be the life of my children and grandchildren. But from the beginning of my life, 
as someone who was born to survivors of the Holocaust in a refugee camp in Stuttgart, Germany on July 1st, 1946, there was nothing expected and everything hoped for. So standing here today with this award from the university that launched me into adulthood in a room that bears my name, feels almost surreal. Thank you, U of T. Thank you, Rose Wolf. And thank all of you for making possible and sharing this incredible journey with me. Thank you.